last year, my laptop broke, and I really needed a new one. I looked around online and also went to Best Buy. Then I had the idea to check on Facebook Marketplace as well. It seemed like it could be the cheapest and fastest option. I didn't need it to be brand new. And I also didn't want to wait for the shipping time of buying a used one online. So I looked on Facebook Marketplace for people that were close to me. Luckily, I live in an area with quite a few other people. I was able to find the laptop that I wanted and found one for a reasonable price as well. It was not too far away and I contacted the seller, expressing my interest in buying it as soon as possible. The seller got back to me a short time later and suggested that I could come over to his house. I didn't like this idea though. While it was possible that nothing bad would happen, I didn't want to go to a random guy's house. I responded to him and said that I would prefer to meet in a public location in the area. The man asked why, and I explained that I just didn't want to go to someone's house that I didn't know. After a little more conversation through Facebook messaging, he finally agreed. He gave me the name of a local restaurant to meet him at, and said that he would be there at 9 p.m. I agreed, and then went to withdraw some cash. I wasn't all that happy that the man wanted to meet at 9 o'clock at night, but at least it was a public location. I had never been to the restaurant before where he wanted to meet. That night, I drove to the suggested restaurant, and it turned out to be a smaller, older-looking place. There was nothing else really close to it, and it was somewhat away from the other businesses in the area. The parking lot was in the back, and after parking, I messaged the seller to let him know I had arrived. He responded, instructing me to come inside. I got out of my car and walked into the restaurant. The place seemed pretty old and more like a bar than a restaurant. I found a small open table, sat down on a stool and looked around. I couldn't identify the guy. His Facebook profile picture was not of himself, but a logo of a sports team. I scanned the place to see if there was a guy with a laptop or sitting alone, but I couldn't spot anyone. I messaged him again, letting him know I was inside and asking where he was. A couple of minutes passed without a reply, and I still couldn't see him. Finally, after about five minutes, I received a notification that he responded. When I read it, he apologized, saying he couldn't make it. I was really confused, since he had just told me to come inside earlier, acting as if he was already there. Frustrated, I decided to leave. I didn't even want to buy the laptop from him anymore. The whole situation felt too weird. I was sure there were plenty of other good laptops for sale and I wouldn't have a problem finding another one. I got up and left the bar, heading to my car in the parking lot behind it. Once inside my car, I started to drive back home. The bar was about 15 minutes from my house, and as I got back onto the roads, they were very quiet. However, after beginning to drive home, a car left the bar right behind me. At first, I thought nothing of it, but the more I drove, it remained right on my tail. After making several turns, it didn't seem like a coincidence anymore. It felt like whoever was driving that car was deliberately following me, especially because they were tailing really close behind. Whether I went faster or slower, they maintained about the same speed. When I got within five minutes of my apartment, I started to really worry. Part of me tried to convince myself that there's no way this car is actually following me. Just me being paranoid. It was a pickup truck that was following me for about average size. I could only see the headlights and I couldn't identify who was behind the wheel. Finally, I reached the turnoff for my apartment. I lived in a pretty large complex with multiple buildings and a huge parking lot. When I pulled in, the truck pulled in as well, 
my worst fear realized. Instead of stopping, I drove all the way through the parking lot and left on the other side. The truck followed me. At that point, it was confirmed 100% to me that I was being followed. My adrenaline was rushing, and I was desperate to lose the car. Still, I knew better than to speed or drive recklessly. Instead, I started turning onto random streets and into random business and restaurant parking lots. I would exit on the other side and get back onto the road. It was probably very clear to whoever was behind me that I knew they were following me, and I was trying to lose them. This went on for quite some time, probably 30 minutes. Soon, though, my gas light came on, signaling that I needed to refuel soon. I got really worried. I couldn't keep this up for much longer. The truck was still right on my tail. I kept doing what I was doing and probably had about 40 more miles left in the tank. Then, when I made a turn, the truck went the other way. I couldn't believe it, but it was finally over. I guess he finally gave up. After the truck drove away, I went and got some gas and then returned to my apartment. I was very careful the entire time, and I did not see the truck for the rest of the drive. After getting back home, I realized that the driver of the truck was likely the seller of the laptop. I hadn't really thought about it when I was being followed, but it all made sense now. He told me that he was inside the bar to try to get me to go in. I went back to look at the listing, and it was now gone. The user had blocked me as well. Whoever he was, I was a little bit worried because originally I did drive to my apartment complex, but I just hoped that he thought it was the first of many. Random places I turned into to lose him. He also wouldn't know which building I lived in or which unit was mine. Luckily though, I never saw him again. I also haven't used Facebook Marketplace since that incident. This was something that happened several years ago now. I was in college, going into my junior year. Up until that point, I lived in the dorms, which was required for underclassmen at my university. For my junior year, I was moving into an off-campus house with three other girls who I was good friends with. The house had a lot of space, with four bedrooms and a bathroom upstairs, and a kitchen, living room, and bathroom on the main floor. It also had a basement. None of us had much furniture, so I went on Facebook Marketplace to find some. I knew that you could usually get free or cheap furniture there. I didn't care if it was used or not, as we would likely only be using it for two years. After looking around on Facebook Marketplace for a while, I found some good options. One that I really liked was a couch that was free and just on the other side of town. The ad said that it was like new and free because the owner had gotten a new couch. The pictures were of good quality and there appeared to be nothing wrong with it at all. This was early in the summer, right after we got the house and it had no furniture at all. I was the only one of the roommates who was there at the time and I decided that I would get this couch for us. The location where the couch was located was just over five minutes away. I asked the owner, and a man named Ryan responded, saying that it was available. Based on his profile picture, he appeared to be in his 40s or 50s, and he looked like an average guy for the most part. I arranged to come and pick it up that night at 7 p.m. I got lucky and was able to borrow a pickup truck from a friend at college so that I could pick up the couch. Couch never would have fit inside my car. When the time came, I drove to the address. Upon arrival, it seemed to be in a pretty average neighborhood for being near a college campus. The houses were all old looking and fairly small. I messaged the owner, Ryan, through Facebook to let him know I was there. I walked up to the front door and rang the doorbell. Ryan answered the door quickly. He was tall and skinny, looking just like his picture. 
Initially friendly, he invited me inside. However, things quickly took a turn for the sketchy. Once inside Ryan's house, after taking a few steps in, he quickly went behind me and stood right in front of the front door. I also didn't see the couch anywhere. As Ryan stood there, I expected him to direct me to the couch, but instead, he started making small talk. He asked about my college, major, and other friendly topics. At first, it seemed normal, but then the conversation took a strange turn. He asked about where I lived, whether I lived alone, and if I was single. After several minutes of this, I brought up the purpose of my visit, the couch. I thought he was being weird. I asked him where it was, and he told me it was just down in his basement. This disappointed me, because the pictures online did not give the impression they were taken in a basement. I specifically remembered seeing natural sunlight, and it looked like it was in a living room, not an underground basement. If he knew he was getting rid of it, why wouldn't he bring it upstairs? Ryan then explained that he would have brought the couch upstairs, but he couldn't lift it by himself. While he was a pretty skinny dude, the couch wasn't one of those huge ones. It was on the smaller side. He stayed standing right in front of the front door, almost like he was blocking it. He then pointed to the basement door, which was maybe 10 feet from where he was standing. I walked over to it, and he said, You can lead the way. I opened up the basement door and looked down the stairs. Suddenly, my sketchy feeling about him intensified. From where I was standing at the top of the stairs, the basement appeared. Couch never would have fit inside my car. When the time came, I drove to the address. Upon arrival, it seemed to be in a pretty average neighborhood for being near a college campus. The houses were all old looking and fairly small. I messaged the owner, Ryan, through Facebook to let him know I was there. I walked up to the front door and rang the doorbell. Ryan answered the door quickly. He was tall and skinny, looking just like his picture. Initially friendly, he invited me inside. However, things quickly took a turn for the sketchy. Once inside Ryan's house, after taking a few steps in, he quickly went behind me and stood right in front of the front door. I also didn't see the couch anywhere. As Ryan stood there, I expected him to direct me to the couch, but instead, he started making small talk. He asked about my college, major, and other friendly topics. At first, it seemed normal, but then the conversation took a strange turn. He asked about where I lived, whether I lived alone, and if I was single. After several minutes of this, I brought up the purpose of my visit, the couch. I thought he was being weird. I asked him where it was, and he told me it was just down in his basement. This disappointed me because the pictures online did not give the impression they were taken in a basement. I specifically remembered seeing natural sunlight, and it looked like it was in a living room, not an underground basement. If he knew he was getting rid of it, why wouldn't he bring it upstairs? Ryan then explained that he would have brought the couch upstairs, but he couldn't lift it by himself. While he was a pretty skinny dude, the couch wasn't one of those huge ones. It was on the smaller side. He stayed standing right in front of the front door, almost like he was blocking it. He then pointed to the basement door, which was maybe 10 feet from where he was standing. I walked over to it, and he said, You can lead the way. I opened up the basement door and looked down the stairs. Suddenly, my sketchy feeling about him intensified. From where I was standing at the top of the stairs, the basement appeared. Down the driveway and away from the house, the basement had given me an eerie feeling, and Ryan's behavior was deeply unsettling. I didn't want to stick around to find out what he had planned. 
I continued running until I felt a safe distance away. Once I caught my breath, I called the police to report the incident. They advised me to go to a nearby public place and wait for them to arrive. I followed their instructions, and when the police arrived, I explained the situation to them. They accompanied me back to the house, and we found it empty. Ryan was gone, and there was no sign of the couch. The police took my statement and assured me they would investigate the matter further. They also advised me to be cautious when using online platforms to arrange meetings and transactions. After that incident, I never used Facebook Marketplace again. It was a terrifying experience, and I felt fortunate to have escaped unharmed. I shared the story with my roommates and friends, emphasizing the importance of safety when meeting strangers, especially in unfamiliar locations. From that day on, I became more cautious about online transactions and always prioritized my safety. The memory of that unsettling encounter remained with me, serving as a stark reminder of the potential dangers that could lurk behind seemingly harmless online interactions. Well, and we eventually made our way back to my house. Annie parked the car and we got out to discuss the details further. She seemed interested in purchasing it and asked if I was flexible with the price. I explained that I had already listed it for $3,000, but we could discuss it further. As we were talking, Annie suddenly mentioned that she needed to go inside her van to grab something. She walked towards her van, which was still parked at the end of my front yard. I didn't think much of it and continued standing near the SUV. However, as she opened the door, I noticed that she was taking longer than expected. Suddenly, I felt uneasy. Something didn't feel right. I decided to stay where I was and observe. Annie was rummaging around in her van, and it seemed like she was intentionally taking her time. After a few minutes, she returned without anything in her hands. Annie then continued discussing the car, but my gut feeling told me that something was off. I politely told her that I needed to think about the offer and would contact her later. She seemed a bit disappointed, but agreed. After Annie left, I went back inside my house and locked the doors. I couldn't shake the feeling that her behavior was unusual. I decided to do some research and found that others had encountered similar situations when selling items on Facebook Marketplace. Given the uncertainty, I decided not to proceed with the sale to Annie. I blocked her on Facebook and removed the listing for my car. It was a lesson learned about being cautious during online transactions, even when selling items in your own driveway. From that point on, I took extra precautions when dealing with potential buyers, such as meeting in well-lit public places and informing someone about the meeting details. While selling items online can be convenient, it's essential to prioritize personal safety and trust one's instincts. Left open, it was a lesson learned, and I vowed to be more vigilant about securing my home in the future. The police took my statement and conducted an investigation based on the information I provided. Unfortunately, without the license plate number, it was challenging for them to track down the suspects. I felt violated and frustrated that my attempt to sell my car had turned into a traumatic experience. In the following weeks, I took additional security measures, installing a security system and being more cautious about sharing personal information online. I also shared my story with friends and neighbors, emphasizing the importance of home security and being vigilant during online transactions. Reflecting on both encounters with Ryan and Annie, I realized the importance of trusting my instincts and prioritizing safety over convenience. 
it was a harsh reminder that not everyone online has good intentions and precautions must be taken to protect oneself. In the end, I was grateful that neither situation escalated to physical harm and I became more cautious about online transactions and home security. These experiences served as a stark reminder that personal safety should always be a top priority, even in seemingly routine interactions. Doctor, feeling a mixture of fear and disbelief, I had never shared my home address with Elliot, and the idea of him showing up uninvited was incredibly unsettling. I decided not to open the door and instead called out, asking what he wanted. Elliot began shouting, demanding that I let him in and threatening to make my life difficult if I didn't. I was frightened and unsure of what to do. I considered calling the police, but I hesitated, hoping he would leave on his own. After what felt like an eternity, I heard him leave. I cautiously approached the window to see him walking away from my house. I decided to report the incident to the police, providing them with as much information as I could about Elliot. In the following days, I took additional security measures, installing security cameras around my home and being more cautious about sharing personal information online. I also considered involving law enforcement to obtain a restraining order against Elliot to ensure my safety. This experience made me acutely aware of the potential risks associated with online transactions, even seemingly harmless ones like selling a used phone. It reinforced the importance of setting boundaries and being cautious about sharing personal information even in the context of a seemingly straightforward transaction. To anyone engaged in online transactions, I would strongly advise being vigilant and prioritizing personal safety. Trust your instincts. And if a situation feels uncomfortable or potentially dangerous, take appropriate steps to protect yourself whether that involves contacting the authorities or seeking legal advice. Accepted. We agreed on the price and set a time for him to come by and pick up the TV. On the agreed upon day, Tim arrived at my house to purchase the TV. I showed him the television and he inspected it to ensure it was in good condition. Everything seemed normal at first and we proceeded with the transaction. Tim handed me the agreed-upon amount in cash, and I helped him load the TV into his vehicle. As Tim was leaving, he seemed friendly and thanked me for the smooth transaction. However, things took an unexpected turn later that evening. I received a message from Tim on Facebook, claiming that the TV was not working correctly and that I had deceived him. I was taken aback because I knew the TV was in perfect working condition when he left with it. Tim started making threats, saying he would report me to the police and leave negative reviews about me online. I was shocked and frustrated by his sudden change in attitude. I offered to refund his money if he returned the TV, but he refused and continued to harass me online. Feeling cornered, I decided to contact the police and report Tim's behavior. They advised me to block him on social media and cease communication with him. I followed their advice, but Tim persisted, creating new accounts to send me threatening messages. Eventually, the police were able to trace the messages back to Tim, and they issued a warning. Fortunately, the harassment ceased after that but the experience left me shaken and wary of online transactions. From that point forward, I became more cautious about selling items online, ensuring that I documented the condition of the item thoroughly and only accepting cash transactions. 
the incident served as a stark reminder of the potential risks involved in online dealings and the importance of prioritizing personal safety in such situations. Address since he had bought the TV from me. I was startled when I heard a knock on my door. And when I looked through the peephole, I saw Tim standing there with a hostile expression on his face. I hesitated to open the door, fearing that Tim might become aggressive. Instead, I called out from behind the door, asking him to leave. Tim started yelling, demanding a refund and making threats. I felt uneasy and decided to call the police to handle the situation. While on the phone with the police, I heard Tim attempting to force open the front door. Panicked, I retreated to a safe location within my home and updated the police dispatcher about the escalating situation. I could hear Tim continuing to bang on the door and shout threats. Fortunately, the police arrived promptly and intervened. They spoke to Tim and explained that his actions were not only inappropriate, but also illegal. The officers warned him to leave immediately or face legal consequences. After their intervention, Tim finally left, but the experience left me shaken. I filed a police report documenting the incident, and they assured me that they would monitor the situation. I was advised to keep my guard up and take extra precautions. In the aftermath, I installed additional security measures around my home including reinforced doors and enhanced exterior lighting. I also shared my experience with friends and family, emphasizing the importance of caution when conducting transactions online. The incident with Tim was a harsh reminder of the potential dangers associated with online sales. It underscored the need to establish clear boundaries, prioritize personal safety, and take appropriate action when faced with harassment or threats. From that point on, I became even more vigilant about protecting myself during online transactions and maintaining heightened security measures around my home. Incident, I decided to file a police report about the vandalism to ensure that there was an official record of the incident. The police advised me to keep a close eye on my surroundings and report any further harassment. In the weeks that followed, I remained vigilant and took extra precautions to ensure my safety. I also continued to share my experience with friends and neighbors, urging them to be cautious when engaging in online transactions and to report any suspicious behavior. The incident with Tim served as a stark reminder of the potential risks involved in online dealings. It reinforced the importance of setting clear boundaries, prioritizing personal safety, and taking appropriate action when faced with harassment or threats. While the situation was distressing, I felt relieved that Tim had not caused any damage to my car, and I hoped to put the incident behind me. Moving forward, I became even more cautious about conducting transactions with strangers, both online and in person. I implemented additional security measures around my home and maintained heightened awareness of my surroundings. The experience with Tim was a valuable lesson, and I hoped that sharing my story would encourage others to prioritize their safety when navigating the world of online marketplaces.